Good morning to everybody and thanks to the Wolf Region organization for this uh, kind invitation to participate in this first international uh, conference. Uh, it's very hard for me to follow my former uh, professor, Xavier Sale Martin. I'll, I'll try to do my, my best. He took a very long view of what has happened in the world economy in terms of trade, investment, innovation. My job is to do something a little bit much more, uh, less ambitious and look at the last 15, 20 years, see what has been the trends, and hopefully to set some of the context that we need for the discussion this couple of days on the rise uh, of uh, free trade zones. My presentation has two parts. The first one, it's just giving you a sense of what I think are the major emerging drivers, the new kind of patterns of global trade and global investment that we have seen, and I'll be looking mostly at the last 15 years. I'll be comparing where we were 15 years ago, mid-90s, and where we are now, sorry, in case, in terms of these uh, global, uh, global trends. Let me just uh, give you a kind of a very simple uh, picture of what has happened in the last 50 years. This, of course, is takes a little bit. It's a, short, uh, it's a shorter period of what Xavier Sala was talking about, which was much, much longer. This looks like a very interesting uh, picture of how trade and GDP have evolved in the last 50 years. If you look at this ratio, you have this picture. This basically tells you that trade has been growing faster than global GDP for the last 50 years at a pace that actually accelerated in the mid-90s. Uh, trade over GDP was less than 10% in the 1950s, 1960s. Today represents more than 25%. This is uh, an important, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, stylized facts of uh, the importance of trade in the global economy. This is also reflects what has happened when you have a big crisis. This is the, the big recession of 2008, uh, 2009 that fell the trade fell more than it fell during the Great Depression, and this is uh, what happens to the ratio in times of uh, big crisis. This is a very interesting picture. This is an average for the world. So trade, on average, has grown faster than GDP if you take the world as an average, but this is not the case if you take region by region. I'm going to look at here at a couple of regions. The one that I know more, which is Latin America. Latin America is a very interesting story. It's a story of having trade less and less important during the 50s, during the 60s, during the 70s, until the mid-90s. The mid-90s, this is when the opening up of Latin America came, and you have a completely different region, a region that is open up to the world, and trade is becoming more and more important in the economy and is growing faster than their GDP. Today, on average, uh, Latin American countries have uh, a 40% ratio of trade to GDP. But it's a very interesting uh, uh, region in which uh, these trends didn't follow the global trends. If you look at Asia, which is the top one in a different scale, you see a different picture. This is a region that trade has been extremely important in the last uh, few decades and a, key, uh, and a key factor for their uh, uh, growth uh, success. I'm going to skip just for the matter of time. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit what has been the kind of the key uh, factors behind or the key stylized facts behind this, uh, these trends. The first one behind this, uh, this uh, uh, growing trade uh, in, the important, in the global economy is one important fact, the participation of emerging and developing economies in global trade. If you look at the 1990s, uh, trade represented only around 20% for developing economies, and the rest, 80%, is trade uh, uh, for advanced economies. This ratio, 20 to 80%, changed uh, very recently to 40 to 60%. Uh, and more importantly, of this trade uh, conducted by emerging and developing economies that today represents around 40% of global trade, more importantly, Almost 20% is South-South trade, trade between uh, uh, developing economies, a trade that was only 5% 10 years uh, ago. So trade among developing economies is an important uh, slight fact in the, in, the recent, in the recent times. And one of the reasons why we have this trade 
Uh, I'm going to skip also this one just for the sake of time. Uh, this is just an example on how this change of patterns of trade creates a completely different situation for regions. This is the, this is the pattern for Latin America, a region that today has as one of its most important partners, Asia. Uh, this is in red, what Asia represents for Latin American trade. It represented less than 10% in, in the 1990s. Today is more than 20% and is projected that it will be more than 30% by, 2000, uh, by 2025. So this is a region in which you have a completely different pattern of, of uh, partners of trade due to this uh, changing uh, of the structure of uh, global trade. The U.S. is becoming less and less important for Latin America. It used to be the first partner, today is the second. It's going to be probably the third or even the fourth uh, in, in 2025. Uh, and, and Europe also becoming a, a, lower, a lower partner. I'm going to skip this one also for the sake of time. And here is just one of the essential factors that has already been mentioned of why this uh, more and more participation of emerging and developing countries in global trade. One of the main reasons is this fragmented system of production that we have today that has been already referred by the two speakers before me. More and more, the products that you produce are not the final goods. The things that you produce more and more are intermediate goods, are inputs that someone else will use for the final uh, production. And this is, a, it, this is a recent phenomenon. Uh, there's different ways of measuring that. I'm sure that Robert may comment also on that, uh, on that feature. Uh, this is one very interesting way of looking at that. This is the relationships of multinationals on their vertical FDI. This, the vertical FDI, as you know, means investments that multinationals do outside their home countries to produce not the same thing that they produce at home, but rather to produce inputs that they will be used for final production. So this is, these are the picture that shows the relation between multinationals and vertical FDI around the world. And you see these kind of clusters of FDI around main centers like the United States, uh, Europe, uh, and Asia. And you see right away two regions that are a little bit out of this picture. One is Africa and the other one is Latin America. Those are two regions that are not yet fully integrated in this way of uh, fragmented uh, production. There's another way of measuring this, which uh, Robert has done uh, a lot of work on, on this. We have actually extended some of the work that the WTO and the OECD has done uh, for Latin America. And this is the way of measuring your participation in a global value change by the foreign value added of your exports. That means how much of your exports are actually things that you have imported from someone else. So things that have you imported first, and then you use it for the production of the final good. This foreign value added of exports is a very good measure on how regions participate in this global value change. It's uh, relatively large. It's almost 40% for the European Union, uh, more than 30%, 35% for Asia. And for Latin America, it's only 20%. And this includes Mexico, that is a country very well integrated with the US, uh, US market, much, much less if you exclude Mexico. So there are very important differences in terms of this participation in global value, value change. A, a similar picture is, and is related to what I just, uh, uh, I just uh, show, is the global FDI. Global FDI has also had profound structural changes. If you look at uh, early 2000s, and you go back to 1990s even more, uh, most of the global FDI in terms of inflows was advanced economies, 80% uh, of uh, FDI inflows went to advanced economies, only 20% to developing economies. Today, it's 50-50. This is a big change in terms of the recipients, who is receiving FDI around the world. And also, very interestingly, very similar to what's happening in trade, more and more of it, this FDI is South-South FDI. So this is FDI that takes place within uh, the group of uh, emerging and developing economies. Big structural change in the trade and uh, uh, global uh, FDI inflows. Uh, just a quick reference, because uh, Xavier mentioned that, the importance of services. More and more services are an important part uh, of the value added. Uh, in terms of the percentage of global trade, has a, it's not changed too much, but it's, it's, it's more and more services are embedded in manufacturing. It's more and more difficult to distinguish between 
what you export, uh, if it's a good or if it's actually a service. And I think Xavier gave a very good numbers, a very good example on how this uh, has changed in the last few years. Uh, just going to skip again this one for, uh, for sake of time. This is just show how much uh, concentrated are this uh, specialization on services. Very few countries, very few uh, economies are uh, top producers of uh, services. And the final point I want to make in these big structural changes that we observe is that how he, we have regulated in the last 15 years these global trade patterns and these global uh, uh, investment patterns. If you remember in 1995, and Robert I'm sure remembers this very well, uh, we created the WTO. Uh, this was the last time that we signed, uh, except if you exclude the trade facilitation agreement in Bali last year, the last time that we signed a multilateral trade agreement. In 1995, this was the picture of free trade agreements. There were very, very few in the early 90s, uh, FTAs, regional trade agreements. Most of trade was regulated at the global level at the, with multilateral rules, and that's what we created in 1995, the WTO. But if you look 15, 20 years after, the picture is completely changed. Today we have almost 400 free trade agreements in place. Uh, the WTO has not been able to produce any other multilateral agreement in almost 20 years, except the trade facilitation agreement I mentioned last, last year. This is the way that trade is regulated today, mostly through these FTAs, through these regional trade agreements. That just give you a quick, uh, uh, some quick uh, statistics, if I can go back. Uh, it depends on how you compute this. Uh, you could say that almost 50% of global trade is conducted under the rules of these FTAs or free trade agreements. It's a difficult calculation to make, but that's more or less, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, back of the envelope uh, estimate. The type of agreements is very interesting. If you look again at the 1990s, the mid-1990s, the, 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 the way I think some of these structural changes happen, if you look at the type of agreements, the type of FTAs that have been negotiated in the last 20 years, between before 1995, most of the agreements were uh, shallow agreements. Shallow agreements means that those are agreements that deal mostly with tariff liberalization. You are just care about ne uh, negotiating tariffs. Uh, more and more, uh, and if you see the ones that have been negotiated after 95, in these last 15, 20 years that we have just uh, been uh, analyzing, most of, uh, more and more these agreements are deep agreements. These are agreements that go beyond tariffs agreements that include provisions on investment, on services, on government procurement, on technical measures, uh, and so on, uh, intellectual property. So there are much, much complicated agreements that are linked to the type of uh, fragmented production networks that we mentioned before. And actually another uh, very interesting characteristic of these agreements is that more and more these agreements are not north-north, uh, what used to be, mostly the European Union, if you remember the, the history of the European Union in the 60s and the 70s, after the mid-90s, mid more and more of these agreements are north-south agreements, those are agreements signed by a developing economy and a, an advanced economy, and more and more south-south agreements, agreements that have been signed among emerging and developing economies, a completely different type of regulating trade in the last 15, 20 uh, years. I have almost a, a minute to go. Uh, in this context, I just want to put a picture that probably you all have in mind, and I think it gives a little bit of the context of this discussion. It's in the same period, it's in these last 15, 20 years, in these big uh, structural changes, where we are also observing this growth of FTZs, free trade zones, have uh, expanded uh, from almost nothing in the mid-90s to more than 4,000 today. This is the number, this is actually a very recent graph uh, that was produced by the, uh, published at The Economist. Uh, if you look in terms of number of countries who have FTCs, also the jump is also in, this, in, the same, uh, in the same period. This is a little bit outdated number, but it gives you a quick geography of where these FTCs are, mostly in Asia, lots of them also in, uh, in Latin America, and some others scattered uh, to the rest of the world. And just to conclude, I have a few seconds, uh, let me take a minute, a couple of kind of uh, last uh, conclusions of, uh, of this uh, diagnostic of these uh, 20 years or 15, 20 years of uh, changing uh, global trade and changing global uh, investment. One is what should be the trade agenda? And I think Xavier did uh, a good job uh, talking about the long-term issues. 
I mean, things, uh, countries will not be able to bridge some of the gaps in global or regional integration, especially regions like Latin America, the one I mentioned, unless you afford kind of long-term policies, policies that will only pay off in the long term, you know, and, and, and Xavier make a good reference to the, everything that you, you need in, the, in this list. You have to worry about competitiveness, and therefore you have to worry about education, you have to worry about institutions, you have to, uh, work, uh, you have to worry about uh, innovation. But these long-term uh, policies can also be complemented by more uh, short-term, medium-term type of actions, and what I call here uh, an unfinished trade agenda. We have done a lot in terms of uh, liberalizing trade in the last 15, 20 years, but there's still lots more to, to do. And I'm going to summarize, uh, this is not exhaustive, but these are the things that I think are important for the, the, at least the next five, 10 years. First, what I call the missing links. If you look at this global network of FTAs that I just showed you, which is, includes more than 400 linkages between countries that have negotiated, there are important missing links. Kind of the big, big, big uh, economies there have not yet been linked by these FTAs. There's not an FTA between the US and Europe. They are negotiating one. There's no an FTA between Japan or the US. They are negotiating one. So this is lots of missing links between the major economies. There's not a, a, a major FTAs between the BRICS economies. There's no Brazil, no Mexico FTA. There's no Brazil, no China FTA. So there's a big missing uh, links in terms of this type of uh, agreements. That's why, that's why we are now seeing the, the surge in these mega regional negotiations. So another interesting concept, which also refers to this uh, uh, map of uh, network of FTAs, and this I think is an important role for the WTO, which I call conversions. There's a big role for existing FTAs to harmonize some of their own rules. There are very interesting experiments in the region. I'm not going to go in detail because I don't have time, but that's another thing that we will see in the next few years, uh, existing bilateral agreements that get together and try to harmonize some of their own rules among themselves. And finally, I'm going to finish with, uh, with this, uh, is what we call non-traditional costs. And I think this is a very important message for the, this discussion here, for, FT, for FTCs. It's, it's something that matters at the national level, but matters also at the sub-regional level, at the local level which is do not forget that you can do lots of things in terms of trade rules. Uh, you can do lots of things in terms of what we call soft infrastructure, trade facilitation. But unless you complement this with what we call uh, hard infrastructure, uh, uh, investments in logistics, investments in regional infrastructure, in local infrastructure, uh, you cannot get all the returns that you get. I had to hear a, a final uh, analysis that I had for Latin America, I'm just going to give you the, the, the kind of the, the final point here without getting into the details. Uh, in blue, in blue, you see the returns of investments on soft infrastructure. So how much your exports will increase if countries, in this case is Latin America, but this is a very general, it's a very general uh, result. Uh, if you invest in soft issues, trade facilitation, dismantling tariffs, uh, dealing with non-tariff barriers and so on. The red thing is the returns on hard infrastructure, in investments in logistics, in roads, in airports, and so on. The, the, the interesting thing of this picture is that the two of them are almost equally important in terms of size. Infrastructure maybe is a little bit more. And the second point, which is very important, is that these returns cannot be realized unless you do it together. You can have the best customs in the world, but if you don't have the roads to get there, doesn't, you know, doesn't matter too much. Or you can have the best roads, you can have the best airports, but if the customs doesn't function, you will not have also the same returns. And I'm going to leave it back there. Thank you very much.